This BYU Forum address by Gordon Gee was given on March 28, 2006. Dr. E. Gordon Gee is the current Chancellor and Professor of Law at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. He is past president of Brown University, Ohio State University, the University of Colorado at Boulder, and West Virginia University. Dr. Gee graduated from the University of Utah in 1968 with a BA in history. He earned a Juris Doctor in Law and a Doctorate in Education from Columbia University with specialization in education law. Dr. Gee completed a federal judicial clerkship, after which he served as an, assist an assistant dean for the University of Utah College of Law. After serving as a judicial fellow and senior staff assistant for United States Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice Warren Berger, he served as an associate dean and professor in the J. Reuben Clark Law School at BYU, and then following that as dean at the West Virginia University Law School before becoming its president. Chancellor Gee is a member of the steering committee for the National Center for Public Policy and Higher Education. He's also a member of the President's Council for Imagining America, Artists and Scholars in Public Life, the Christopher Isherwood Foundation Board, and the Business Higher Education Forum. Dr. Gee, as you know, is a nationally renowned author and expert in the subjects of education and law. His wife, Constance, is an associate professor of public policy and education at the Peabody College, Vanderbilt University. Following Dr. Gee's remarks, the benediction will be offered by H. Reese Hanson, a professor at the J. Reuben Clark Law School. Let's give a warm welcome to Professor and President and Chancellor Gordon Gee to Brigham Young University. Thank you, Dr. Samuelson. I must admit that I'm grateful that he did not disclose information from our time together as students. He and I were fraternity brothers together. And, uh, uh, and Cecil, I pledge to do the same. Uh, I must say that, that that is one of the most gracious introductions I've received. I, I wasn't going to tell this story, but I just have to because it was so gracious generally. Uh, and uh, and uh, your president can attest to this, university presidents. Uh, are constantly being introduced, uh, sometimes in not such flattering ways, and uh, I'm I'm reminded, uh, Cecil, by your uh, by your introduction about the fact that uh, when I was president of Ohio State, um, I was told a story about the fact that there was a wonderful town in, in Ohio called Chillicothe, Ohio, and uh, they were going to celebrate their centenary, I, their their hundredth year celebration, and they uh, and they invited, uh, and this was in the this was uh, in the early 1900s, and they invited William Howard Taft. Uh, to come and speak, and, uh, and indeed, uh, uh, he consented to come. Now, many of you from your history will remember William Howard Taft is, uh, uh, was the governor of Ohio and then the governor general of the Philippines and then was elected president of the United States and then selected to that most important position in this country to be the chief justice of the United States. And you can wow your uh, professors by uh, noting that he is the only person in the history of this nation to serve as both the chief elective officer and the chief judicial officer. And so they invited him to come, and he said yes, and uh, all of a sudden the people of Chillicothe realized that they did not have anyone they felt of a sufficient stature, unlike your president, to introduce him. And, uh, and so they rummaged around, and they uh, sent out a note to a man by the name of Chauncey Depew. Chauncey Depew was one of our nation's foremost lawyers, had been elected to the United States Senate, was not re-elected, and so made his... Uh, made his living by going around in the uh, tradition of William Jennings Bryan and uh, giving these great oratorical uh, feasts. And so he was absolutely delighted to be asked to introduce the Chief Justice. And uh, he showed up on the podium that day, and here were all the people of Chillicothe uh, spread out in front of him. And he proceeded to go on, uh, Dr. Samuelson, for his introduction for about 45 minutes. I mean, people were falling asleep in their soup. They were doing everything they possibly could do. And finally, uh, Finally, at the end of the introduction, he turned to uh, William Howard Taft and he says, Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you the, the Chief Justice of the United States. Now, one of the things you have to remember about William Howard Taft, not only was he a great American, he was a large American. He weighed well over 300 pounds. He was huge. And so uh, Chauncey Depew turns to him and he says, Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you the uh, Chief Justice of the United States, a man pregnant with ideas. <laughs> a man pregnant with creativity and he sits down and poor William Howard Taft uh, waddles up to the podium and he pats himself like this and he says, well, ladies and gentlemen, if it be a boy, I'll name him William. 
if it be a uh, if it be a uh, if it be a girl, I'll name her uh, I'll name her Catherine. But if, as I suspect, it be gas, I'll name it Chauncey the Pew. <laughs> I don't know why your introduction reminded me of that, Mr. President, but but it did. Uh, I also want to. Uh, thank my former colleagues at the J. Reuben Clark Law School, some of whom are here today, uh, um, for the important part, and I want to say this most seriously, for the important part they played in my life and the vision that they outlined for me and the inspiration that they are for me. Uh, behind me is one of my dearest and uh, best friends is, uh, is Reese Hansen, who served for 15 years as the dean of this inspirational law school, and uh, I want to acknowledge him. I also want to acknowledge someone who is not here who continues to inform my life every day, and that is uh, your former president, Rex Lee, who was the founding dean of our law school here and uh, recruited me, uh, some unknown young guy, and, uh, and gave me a great opportunity. And for him, but for him, I would not be standing here, and so I do acknowledge that. Um, of course, uh, none of them believe that I would ever amount to much, and they are right at least in the eyes of many faculty uh, uh, in universities, presidents rank slightly below uh, congressmen and journalists, uh, journalists and, and in terms of importance, so I do acknowledge that. But as President Samuelson uh, has discovered, the university presidency is both full of peril and humor, particularly for someone like me. For example, I just do not look like a university president. I've always tried, but I've just never been able to quite make that happen. And, uh, and, and it, it was driven home to me very recently. I'm, I, uh, I came to uh, Vanderbilt in, in the year 2000. I came from Brown University. And, uh, and my very first day on campus, all the freshmen were coming onto campus. And so I walked across a beautiful campus. I walked across the, the, uh, the quad. And, uh, and I saw these two freshman young ladies coming toward me. And they were just chattering and having a great time. And all of a sudden, one of them looked at me. And she recognized me. I thought, this is fabulous. I've been here three hours. This student already knows me. And so not, uh, not wanting to interrupt them and wanting to be cool, I kind of nodded to her. And she nodded to me and uh, nodded to the other student, she nodded to me, and finally they passed me, and uh, they got about 10 yards past me, and I heard uh, the one whisper the other one, she says, Katie, she said, wasn't that Orville Redenbacher? Um, <laughs> so uh, it, comes, it comes with perilous times, Mr. President, let me assure you that. Uh, one, of the things, one of the things that I, uh, that I enjoy doing um, as part of being a university president, I, is I enjoy going out and reading to uh, to students in the grade schools around uh, around our area. And I just uh, I just had this wonderful uh, opportunity to read to second graders in the Aiken School in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, and then their teacher, of course, had everyone sit down. Now you write that guy a note, and so they wrote me th these lovely notes. I thought you would appreciate their dear Principal Gee. You read good, but you need to practice holding the books up so I can see the pictures better. <laughs> Maybe you should practice with your Vanderbilt students. Uh, dear Mr. Gordon, it was fun to meet you. Thank you. Me and my friend Betsy want to know if you buy all of your ties from McDonald's or just the red ones. <laughs> Mr. Gordon, thank you for coming to visit. It was fun because you're almost the same size as us, very small, which I thought. But this is my favorite one. This comes from Jamie Schott. Jamie is a third grader in the Carter Lawrence School. Dear Dr. Gee, thank you for giving us your time. I thought it was exciting and fun. I learned that looks can be deceiving. So, uh, what can I say? Anyway, anyway, it's a wonderful life, and uh, I am privileged to have served uh, in, in these capacities, and I am truly honored to have been invited to uh, BYU as a forum speaker. However, let me just be very clear, the neurotic part of me cannot help but notice that I was invited as a forum speaker, not a, not a devotional speaker. So I am now plagued by insecurity. I mean, do I not seem spiritual enough? <laughs> Have I become too secular? Have I fallen from grace by moving to Tennessee? I would not be the first, I might note, to be certain, but uh, you know how it is to return to your home territory and to try to cut some sort of figure in it. Um, you want to impress, and you want to be thought well of, to live up to everyone's best wishes for you that they, that they had upon your leaving. Whatever you may think of me, and even if I have become too secular, I cannot return to my home state of Utah or to visit this magnificent campus which stands for so much, which has helped so many people without feeling as though I am making a pilgrimage home. I cannot ever come back to Utah without feeling a devotional purpose in my return. And Utah has for 
so much of its history been a place of pilgrimage in its own right. So as I considered my remarks, the discussion of my vocation as a university president and chancellor, and the years I have been honored to be able to serve five very distinct, magnificent universities in that capacity, began to take on a devotional tinge. I realized that everything I might have to talk about to you, the entire way I have spent my life and how I learned to make appropriate decisions and how I have any authority at all to speak to you in a forum capacity comes from my upbringing as a Latter-day Saint. That was, to me, an intense realization. And I also realized that it has been my wanderings in this world, my time spent outside of the safe and rich haven of Utah that made me more aware of the merits of my own faith. To say that my faith had not been tested is not entirely accurate. Latter-day Saints have so much field testing in our principles and duties of mission. But I should say instead that in my case, my faith, that is a legacy of my family and their gifts to me, had not fully been proven to me. And in that case, not proven until I had seen it exercised in my dealings with others as a university president. Even if I do not know that faith as a theologian knows it, at least I understand in my heart and know it as a practice because I have come to see its similarity in its interweaving with the mission of higher education. For many years, I have thought about my professional development in this way, that everything I know about running a university I have learned from my mistakes. But as you know, what we learn in our life eventually connects back up to where we stand spiritually, to what we know about ourselves in relation to the faith in which we were raised or in which we have come to believe. Most of the mistakes I made occurred at the moments I was not paying attention to the kind of leader, the kind of person I wanted to be. So I may say then that everything I know about being a Latter-day Saint I've learned from running universities. As you might know, I am from Vernal, Utah, where the hippest characters in town have been extinct 70 million years. <laughs> I often laugh that I was 18 before I ever met a non-Mormon or a Democrat, <laughs> or a dinosaur, I might note. Uh, missions are a particular grace to people like me from small rural towns like Vernal because they bring us out so we may look around. I can remember the hysterical telephone call that I received from my wonderful mother uh, when she uh, called up in tears and she said, uh, now of course I understand uh, from, uh, from Dean Hansen now that all of this is done online, but when I was called on my mission, uh, you had an interview and then you sort of waited and then all of a sudden a fat letter came and uh, they would tell you where you're going, you had no idea. And so my mother opened up the letter, I, uh, called me, uh, I was at the University of Utah at the time, she called me up and she had big tears in her eyes and she said, son, she said, I hate to tell you you're going to Bulgaria. Now, now the thing about it is, is that in 1961, Bulgaria, she had looked on the map, Bulgaria was about as far behind the Iron Curtain as you should get. She thought that I had done some awful thing and was being sent away. Well, the truth of the matter is I was being sent to Bavaria, which is in southern Germany. And so, um, so after, I, of course, there were a few moments of her. I said, Mother, read that again. She did, and uh, we all had a great relief. But, uh, but, but it was that moment. Uh, and so I went on my first mission after my first year at the University of Utah, but I never would have thought that my life's work would be the most deepening mission of all. Anyone who is acquainted with the responsibilities of a university presidency can attest that it is a role that hyper-accelerates your existence. You can make hundreds of new acquaintances in one day, and each one of those friendships has its own demands of relationship. You have hi a heightened accountability because you are the one person who cannot outsource blame or praise for anything that happens at your university. And so often is attention on you that you have to attend very closely to the details of your private persona. So as you can imagine, I received probably, before I was ready for it, a crash course on what kind of person and even what kind of saint I wanted to be. The first lesson I learned that deepened my understanding of my spirituality is that I had to be comfortable with what I am and what I represent as a university president. My experience as a unique and highly symbolic figure on campus has inoculated me to any suspicion others may have about me as idiosyncratic or exotic or representative of a minority. 
On any campus, the chief executive uh, officer is something of a unicorn. In your uniqueness, there is no anonymity. Everyone knows who you are, and everyone has an opinion about how you should lead or how you should spend your time or even how you should dress. I remember this story so very well. I'm 36 years of age. I'm the new president of West Virginia University. Uh, I like to wear Argyle socks. I like to wear Argyle sweaters. I like to wear bow ties. I like to wear, uh, I like to wear khakis. And so that's what I continue to do. And three distinguished members of the faculty came in one day and they said to me, they said, you know, we're disappointed in you. And I said, why? And they said, well, you don't look or act like a university president. I looked in the mirror and I am disappointed in myself. But anyway, uh, um, and so they said, you've got, you've, got to, you've got to act like one. And of course, my vision was uh, the tall, gray-haired, gravelly-voiced person, someone who looks like uh, Dr. Samuelson. But uh, <laughs> that was never to be. And so I tried to change. And so I started being a little bit more aloof. I wore suits, three piece of variety of other things. And, and ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I'll use whatever I want to. Um, we're all friends. Um, I did that for a while, and two things happened. One, I was miserable. And two, I was failing. And a great lesson for me is the fact that you have to be who you are, not what other people want you to be. I changed. I go back today at Vanderbilt. I wear Argyle socks. I wear khakis. I wear bow ties. And I'm a very happy person. A great lesson for me. After more than 25 years in this position, I know that if any human can handle that kind of scrutiny, he can bear up as a representative of what he believes in his innermost, innermost heart of hearts. I have learned to have thick skin, nerves like sewer pipes, and a good sense of humor. Feeling criticism is part of the nature of a university presidency, but remaining calm in the face of criticism is excruciatingly difficult, as, it, as is not uh, feeling stampeded by emails, telephone calls, and letters flooding into one's office. I wonder, I wonder if it was the experience gained on my mission that has made me appreciate the strength of character that is required in such situations, or if it was being in such situations as a university president that helped me to understand exactly what was taking place inside my heart on my mission. I learned that my experiences in mission had been intended also to impart strength to me, whether I had that strength at the time or even whether I acquired it later. I now realize part of the benefit of those trips, what they are intended to do for us. From presiding over five universities, I learned humility. I learned not to believe what the alumni magazine says about me. I learned that it is possible for a university president still to possess all the frailties of humankind. I learned that although I was serious about my position, serious about my vocation, I would not let seriousness turn into seriousness about myself. Because then not only would I have been unbearable to be around, I would be vulnerable to puncture at any moment. I can remember well, again, a Vanderbilt experience. I moved into the student center. Most university presidents live in, uh, and I shouldn't say this, most university presidents live in big houses and beg. And most university presidents uh, also uh, are in administrative offices. I decided I want to change the culture. So I moved into the student center. I had an open office there. And the students could come wander in and feed the president, do whatever they wanted to do. And, um, and um, I did that for a year. And my assistant, my wonderful assistant, Ruth Ann Brown, uh, after I was there for a short period of time, she came and rushed in. She said, well, she said you need to go to the men's room. I didn't. But uh, she, uh, she persuaded me to do so anyway. And so I went down. And as I walked in, there was one of these, these things. You've seen them up there where you push on them and the air flows out. And up above it, uh, some very clever student had said, push and talk to the chancellor. So uh, you can understand the kind of uh, life you lived. Uh, that said, I also have learned to be realistic in my conception of myself as just one of the individuals of the university. It is true that I do not find the same encumbrances in the bureaucracy as others do. I have to understand that my experience, my experience differs from others within the same institution, and that difference insists that I reach out to those others across the gulf of differences which separates our experiences. I have learned the value of recognition and of appreciation for all of the talents it takes to run a huge and complex institution like a research university. I have learned to recognize humans in their worth and dignity, not just as a theory, but, 
by actually watching and by being in awe of the skills and the dedication of the people around me. I learned to treat everyone within the institution as a teacher, as a teacher, everyone as a teacher, no matter what that person does. John London. John London cleaned my office in the student uh, center. I would stay late at night. John London has an eighth grade education. John London is a wonderful man. John London was frightened to death of me. And finally one night I asked him if he wouldn't tell me a little bit about himself and about the university. He would come in and we would have these kind of little short chats and finally he sat down. And in, in that conversation and subsequent conversations, I learned more about the university than I learned from the academic vice president uh, or the, the vice chancellors, from everyone else. Because John experienced the university. John experienced the university in real time, in real life, in real ways. John London was a great teacher and is a great friend of mine still. Learn from everyone. I've gained the ability to see that students are also partners in the university's effort. That all individuals on campus, as one might categorize them as great and small, are members of a community that depends upon them. I've learned that respecting the worth and contribution of each individual is the only way to live not only the intellectual values, the intellectual values of the university, but also the values of my religion. I have also learned not to expect automatically that other people at a university will treat each other with respect. I realized I could not and still cannot passively expect that this will happen. Tolerating intrigue is a mistake for any of us. I have to exercise my prerogative and make forthrightness an active expectation. Life is hard enough without having to spend time around egotistical, duplicitous, abrasive people. Just as in any faith community, people at universities should have a proper touch of perspective and courtesy and should take their colleagues, especially those with lesser titles, seriously. Another realization I had is that the expectation of excellence we have of ourselves as Latter-day Saints is uh, similar to the expectations of excellence that must be upheld at a university. But I also realized that expectation is not just punitive, but has a real practical application of the way people work together and the quality of their working relationship with one another. Lowering, lowering the standards of an organization to support people who are not passionate, enthusiastic, or engaged with their work hurts everybody. Because first, resentment brews, and after that stage comes one even worse, when no one is inspired to try their hardest. I learned that belief matters and the spirit of a community matters for the sustenance and health of a community's long-term life. And that goes for a faith community just as much as it does an intellectual community. I learned that I must also believe unequivocally in the institution that I'm blessed to lead. I was given advice by a great friend of mine, uh, one of the great icons in higher education, uh, Clark Curry, said, don't love the university too much. I tended to believe him for a while, and I made the mistake very early of trying to restrain my involvement with the university and discovered quickly how dry and unfulfilled that dispassion made my life. I realize now that passion for vocation, passion for mission, is what invigorates an institution and enables it to thrive. Your passion, your passion is proof of belief in what you have committed yourselves to do. And from working with different casts of academic and administrative personnel over the course of my career, I learned that the people with whom we surround ourselves, with whom we collaborate, are visible evidence of the invisible qualities that we value. A work community often also becomes a community of faith, if not faith in a religious sense, of faith in a shared purpose and mission that is constantly renewed and renewing. From enacting and examining university traditions that had accreted to different campuses over the year, I learned that tradition should never be honored for its own sake, but that practiced because it is relevant. Saying that this is always the way we have done things at BYU, at Vanderbilt, at Ohio State, uh, is never, in my view, sufficient. I learned that a university, just like a faith, is not a museum, but that tradition should be alive, should be authentic, should be living and dynamic, and should enhance the lives of those who observe that tradition. At the same time, I have learned that the coherence and character of an institution, if worth anything at all, are worth preserving. I have learned to guard against too much embrace of the catechisms of the moment, or to be addicted to change for change's sake. 
I have learned that the needs of my ego and my desires for immortality and fame cannot compete with the importance a university has in the minds and hearts of those loyal to it. And I have learned that at a university, the belief in the human capacity for self-transcendence can coexist with free and open discussion and debate. That, in fact, open discussion is what brings the human spirit to transcend its selfish impulses and its limitations and its narrow view. That honoring others by listening to them is one of the surest ways to get over oneself. Unit of universities have one role in the world. They are places of ideas, of daily commerce in thousands of different outlooks. It may seem contradictory that one can encompass all those ideas, can fully inhabit a university community, and can still live a life of one's own faith. And in this, I arrive at the most important lesson that I have learned, and I learned it from being around universities, which is how much like the enterprise of a university our faith is and how much we as Latter-day Saints have to bring to that enterprise. The mission work I have done, the mission work you have done and are daily doing has granted us the opportunity to experience the complexities of the world. We are already trained in complexity. Every time we return from a mission, we carry the world in our work and all we have learned embedded within our hearts and minds. And Utah, as universities are, a hub, a nexus for a great web of mission and education that extends out and embraces the world. Educated spirits such as ours, open minds, and open hearts such as ours are critical to achieving positive results in this world, to making this whole world healthier and more just for all those who inhabit it. Through mission, just as at university, we learn that we belong to an international community, to a planetary community, and how many ways there are within that community, not only to view a problem, but also to solve a problem. In my own life, I have traveled from the land of the dinosaurs through presidencies at five major universities, and at every one of those universities, I know how blessed I was to assist in an enterprise that throws people from many different cultures together in one utopian environment and allows them to talk, think, and work together with the common aim, however they might approach it, of making our world safer and humane. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, the university is a mission. And the faith of that is true, and the future is entrusted especially to those of us who are trained in mission. The mission of our lives as Latter-day Saints is the bringing and bearing of light and peace. We are especially enabled in this conflicted, chaotic, and confusing time in our civilization's life to let our faith transform the ideals of the moment rather than being captured by them, to direct our future together instead of waiting to see where we land. We must stop to consider the notion which established Brigham Young University. As the Church itself has become worldwide, we as Latter-day Saints must acknowledge that we are no longer just a peculiar people, but a people who, due to their mission work and knowledge of the world, and pecu are peculiarly positioned to make a difference within it. As Latter-day Saints, we are no longer served by a persecution mentality or an enclave mentality, nor would such a mentality ever, ever be worthy of us. We have nothing to fear of loss or distillation from taking part in the world around us. I can say from my own experience how many gifts we have to contribute to our world. If we believe our faith is universal, then we have to continue to get out into the world. Beyond having nothing to fear, I would say that we have everything to gain, and even more accurately, that we have everything to contribute. We are workers of peace and bringers of knowledge. That mission has always been, but now it is amplified and there is new urgency to it. Your unique experiences as missionaries to different cultures will place you in a position to heal the world, to participate in international community as our faith expands outward. From a very small denomination and from small towns like Vernal, we become a secular leadership. We have a spiritual home in Utah, and from this house of pilgrimage, we extend outward in a worldwide sweep. We will never leave behind that faith that enwraps us, that faith that protects us, even as we may travel away from our spiritual base. In some ways, it may even be easier to live one's faith away from a large group. 
That, of course, seems counterintuitive, but when one has to wear one's faith as a badge and as a signaling part of our, one's identity, one can no longer be rigorously complacent. Even with less reinforcement, religion changes from being a component of one's culture to more of a private matter, individually chosen over and over again with every lesson learned, expressed in the practice of everyday life, and never taken for granted. One final point, and isn't that word final a cheerful one? <laughs> After all my years as a university president, I have learned that work itself cannot be the ultimate value of one's life. I have learned that work should not ever be at the expense of one's interior life, of one's spirit, and that any achievement that comes at the price of joy and growth, at the price of reflection, is empty indeed. I have learned that work is best when shot through with spirit, when justified by soul, when inspired by service and sense of mission. I continue to learn, after much trial and error, what it means to be a fully rounded and successful person with a life of faith. And I learned the hard way, ever since accepting my first job as university president of West Virginia, that I thought I was ready but was not really ready for. I have learned that our mission should not end when we return from where we are sent, but that we are always sent. We are always sent. That we can coexist with good faith with others who are unlike us and thoughtfully celebrate the beauty of this various world. And that everything we do know about, our, about why our faith works comes from life and is supported by life and is sensed through doing what we do. This, my brothers and sisters, I have learned from the blessings of being a university president. This I have learned from an informed faith. This you will also learn. So God speed you on your own remarkable journey and mission. Thank you very much. For more information on this BYU Forum address, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This BYU Forum address by Gordon Gee was given on March 28, 2006. Don't miss the next live...